Hello and welcome to the Coffee Conversation from the Hugh Lane Gallery in Dublin. My name is Jessica Fahey and I'm going to talk to you today about two fascinating paintings from the collection. Um, since the gallery is unable to open at the moment due to uh, COVID-19 and to try and keep everyone safe, and we've decided to go online. So hopefully you enjoy this uh, talk and uh, be sure to check our website for further talks. So as I say, I'm going to talk about two paintings from the Hugh Lane collection. Usually we would do this in the gallery, standing in front of the paintings, but actually the opportunity to uh, do this with a larger PowerPoint presentation uh, allows me to uh, bring in other links and other connections. So the two paintings you can see already on either side here. Uh, the first on the left hand side is by the English artist uh, Frank Brooks, um, and this is a portrait of Hugh Lane's mother, uh, Adelaide Lane, uh, knee purse from 1901. And on the right hand side, a painting by the much more famous artist, uh, William Orpen, or Sir William Orpen, to give him his full title, of the Reverend James William Lane, the father of Hugh Lane. So it's these two paintings that we're going to concentrate on today, but I wanted to, I suppose, initially put them into the context of Hugh Lane himself and uh, look a little at these ideas of um, why these paintings are important but also why uh, some knowledge of his parents might be insightful into understanding Hugh Lane as well of course of telling the story of these two individuals. So I'll look at those kind of elements first and then come back to looking at the individual artists that are painting these two works. So uh, an extraordinary, uh, useful and valuable um, text uh, for looking at the life of Hugh Lane comes from Lady Gregory. And she herself uh, was his aunt, so she knew the family very well. And she wrote uh, a biography of Hugh Lane, um, which was published, as you can see here, in 1921, with various sort of reworkings um, uh, later. Um, and what she said in relation to Hugh Lane and his parents, she said, when I, to quote, she said, when I sometimes said to Hugh that two lives had been spoiled, been squandered for his making, I said it half in jest. And yet in pondering as to where he came from, what his roots were, how that daring imagination and amazing fulfillment found its place in the line of a country family of Galway, a professional family of Cork, it sometimes seems to me that I did not exaggerate, that the sacrifice was necessary, that a clash between opposing natures had been needed to create such a fiery current, that the force which enabled him to accomplish in his shortened life so much that will endure could have come from no other well head than that romantic, unhappy marriage, that ill-mated -ma parentage. So the ill-mated parentage that she's talking about, uh, of course, are Adelaide and James that I showed you the portraits of a moment ago. But it's really interesting to think that Lady Gregory sees the difficulty um, of this marriage as something romantic and something in turn that in, informs and inspires who Hugh Lane becomes. And this is something that comes up again in, in her description of Hugh Lane. Now, I have to say that some people, even at the time of her writing Hugh Lane's uh, biography, that she um, uh, got some criticisms for certainly favouring her side of the family, uh, unsurprisingly, um, but also um, really twisting things to a certain extent anyway, uh, through her lens and how she wanted things to be seen and understood. So <clears throat> Hugh Lane, uh, here's the gallery, uh, a photograph of the gallery as it looks today. Um, he was uh, most known for, best known for, establishing Dublin's Municipal Gallery of Art in 1908, considered to be the first of its kind, a purpose uh, separate um, gallery for uh, modern art. Um, and he essentially um, would fight for um, this collection to be given a permanent home in Dublin and this became quite a controversial thing particularly uh, around the time of 1913, 1913 lockout as well as certain tenement buildings falling and the idea that this man wanted to give uh, a collection of art that some were delighted to have uh, and some thought was uh, 
um, some sort of scam or some sort of waste of money. So he was up against it uh, when trying to form this gallery and it took quite some time before it was given a permanent home. Um, but even before he had opened the doors, he was already recognised uh, by quite a lot of the Dublin society for his um, abilities and for his generosity. So this painting by John Singer Sargent, um, a portrait of Hugh Lane from 1906, and it was commissioned by Lane's supporters and presented to him at a ceremony in Dublin on the 11th of January 1907. Uh, and there's a little plaque on the front of it that says this was for his strenuous labour for the public good, tireless energy and splendid generosity, combined with brilliant organisation capacities and fine judgement. So high praise, very much so. Um, and we can examine some of these ideas of his character and personality, as I say, by looking at his parents, which we'll continue to do in a moment. Um, but just to point out that uh, in terms of looking at his uh, career overall, that um, it is significant to, I suppose, think about where he comes from in relation to uh, a background, because he's assumed due to being you know, knighted and having these accolades and uh, having a, a very sort of successful and prominent position in society, that he was from uh, a wealthy background. And it actually really isn't true. Um, in fact, his parents were um, a love match that didn't really do well financially, um, and he was left to make his own living. So as I say, we'll concentrate on his parents for a moment and these two paintings which are the main subject of my coffee conversation today. So uh, to go first to looking at his mother. So this is uh, Adelaide Lane or Frances Adelaide Lane to give her her full name. And she was born in 1840, died in 1909. And um, here she is painted by uh, Frank Brooks, um, who knew her personally. And it seems that the dedication written on the lower part of uh, the painting is to my friend, uh, F.A. Lane. So uh, Frances Adelaide Lane. So this is uh, a familiar portrait from painted by someone who knew her. She was uh, a great beauty throughout her uh, early years in particular. This seems to be her defining uh, characteristic. Um, she was born at Roxburgh House uh, near Loch in County Galway. Uh, her father, Dudley Press, had 13 surviving children. She was the third youngest of his second marriage, which was to Francis Barry. And uh, they had quite a easy, relaxed, uh, uh, relatively luxurious upbringing, as you can see even just from the size of the house here, that this is not a lowly background. They saw themselves as sort of landed gentry, I suppose is the best way to describe them, um, and were quite snobbish, arguably, as a result. Uh, the house itself was destroyed in a fire uh, in 1922 uh, during the Irish Civil War. So it's no longer uh, remaining. Um, but we do luckily have some uh, photographs to get an idea. So as I say, a large family. Um, but what we know most about really are the members of the family who were closest in age or certainly that spent the most time with Lady Gregory. Um, and she herself described uh, herself and some of her sisters uh, this way. She said, Elizabeth was the clever one of the family. Uh, Elizabeth went on to marry Walter Shaw Taylor, another um, member of the landed gentry, and actually um, was described as being the one who run, ran the whole estate. And after her passing, her husband uh, had a sort of, a, a, almost like a breakdown because he wasn't able to cope without her help. Um, Gertrude, the musical, also married well. And she says of herself that she was the popular, so Lady Gregory uh, or Augustus, uh, uh, Augusta Purse, as she was then, uh, was the popular. And Adele was the beauty. Um, she uh, made uh, sort of comments essentially in the biography of Hugh Lane on how this meant that within the family the, the decision was made because of course so many children that Adelaide as the beauty would be the one sent to Dublin for the season at the um, uh, Viceroy's um, uh, court in Dublin and uh, as such she would be the great hope of the family. 
<clears throat> and Lady Gregory later writes that they had hoped that she'd come back with some, you know, a duke or someone very high up uh, in the nobility of uh, England and Ireland or the United Kingdom. And um, this isn't what happened, of course. So there was a little bit of scandal in relation to that. But one of my favourite anecdotes that uh, Lady Gregory tells about um, uh, this um, position her sister had is that Lady Gregory tells a story of when she's going through London in a carriage with um, Hugh Lane and she points to a bronze sculpture of some important man and mentions that he at some point was actually um, a sort of dance partner or suitor perhaps of her mother, of his mother, of Hugh Lane's mother, Adelaide. So this I, uh, idea um, shocked and thrilled um, Hugh Lane, apparently, according to Lady Gregory. So if we have a quick little look at this wonderful painting by Rose Barton, actually, in the National Gallery of Ireland, of going to the levee at Dublin Castle from 1897. So it's a little bit later than the time that Adelaide would have been going, but not much. And it allows us to get a sort of sense of the sort of pomp and ceremony and the arriving in carriages and um, people gathering on the street to see all these beautiful uh, young women and um dashing men and wealthy men and um, as they arrive for this sort of marriage market essentially at, at the season uh, at Dublin Castle. Um, Rose Barton incidentally knew the Lane family and uh, was very much a great supporter of Lane's uh, idea to open uh, a modern uh, art gallery in Dublin. So if you are interested in uh, reading a little bit more there's just a, a view of that gate uh, from Dublin Castle so you can see Rose Barton's there. If you're interested in reading a little more around um, the sort of coming out or the season, uh, the ball season in um, Dublin, I can really recommend reading A Drama in Muslim uh, by George Moore, uh, who also was a friend of Hugh Lane. And he writes this uh, really uh, fascinating uh, account of uh, these sisters and uh, women coming out um, at the annual ball and it gives us as I say an insight and in what it might have been like for uh, Adelaide uh, Purse as well. So um, as I've already mentioned a lot of what we know about um, uh, her sister and the sort of early um, life of Hugh Lane as well as sort of chronologically ordering the rest of his life comes from uh, Augusta Gregory who as you can see here, it was a uh, purse before she married. She married relatively late, so she was in her late 20s and uh, to um, a man who was quite significantly older than her, but by all accounts, she was very happy with her choice and they were quite well suited in terms of their interests. He was very interested in art, art and literature and so was she. Uh, they travelled together as well um, and were very well connected to other like-minded uh, people at the time. So she was also born at uh, Roxburgh House and uh, is best known uh, really as a playwright uh, as well as folklorist and a literary and arguably artistic patron too. So we can see in this portrait uh, here, this is by uh, Antonio Mancini, who Hugh Lane um, met in Rome and was a great fan of and uh, decided to transport him to Dublin to paint some um, portraits and hopefully get more commissions from people in Dublin. Mostly, I think it was really only Hugh Lane that commissioned any works from him. Um, and you can see that he had quite a unique way of working. You can make out on the canvas here uh, that there are these uh, lines um, that suggest a sort of grid system. And what we know from Lady Gregory and of course some other accounts of other sitters is that what he would do is actually place a frame in front of the sitter with wire marking out this even grid system and then he would replicate that grid system by using um, uh, uh, wire or string uh, over his canvas as well to sort of mark out this idea of uh, working from a grid system which is a way of easily scaling up or scaling down that artists had used for you know uh, centuries. So 
uh, Lady Gregory um, gets the Mancini treatment, which is, of course, to paint in this thick, wild kind of impasto style. Um, it's quite experimental and um, not really the typical um, style of portraiture popular in uh, Dublin at this time. So it is something ultimately um, quite special. And uh, there's a few stories around this and around the sitting for it. And um, it was... Uh, one of those um, kind of almost mythical stories about Hugh Lane was that he was very tight with money um, for everyday things, but yet extraordinarily generous in terms of giving gifts to people, individuals, or giving gifts to museums, galleries, uh, um, working for no fee if he was particularly passionate about a job, these kind of things. But the story around Mancini is that because Mancini used his oil so thickly, um, that it seemed sort of wasteful. And apparently Hugh Lane would go in at the end of the day after you know uh, Mancini working on a portrait like this. Uh, and because Hugh Lane was paying for it all, he would scrape off some of the uh, excess paint and put it back onto the palette uh, so that it could be used again the next day and it wouldn't just be more paint piled on and piled on. So uh, one of those interesting stories. Um, the insert here as well, just to show you from the Irish National Theatre Society at the Abbey Theatre, uh, plays by Lady Gregory, uh, W.B. Yeats and J.M. Singh from 1904-19. Uh, uh, oh five. So this is uh, where her legacy comes from, ultimately, as I already mentioned, really as a playwright. And um, in terms of looking at some of the programs, you can find quite a lot of them um, on, uh, you know, replica, um, uh, lots of them online. So versions that you can see online, uh, like this one here of the White Cockade, a comedy in three acts by Lady Gregory. And here she is um, using the um, logo, if you like, for the Abbey Theatre. It's still the logo for the Abbey Theatre, although down here you can see it's been altered a little bit, modernised a little bit. And this was um, created by Eleanor May, Mary Darwin, um, who uh, was married to a relative of Charles Darwin. And she designed this uh, woodcut, this uh, pear wood engraving, to be used as, as the logo. And it was actually commissioned by W.B. Yeats, who she had met at Cool Park in 1899, Cool Park being the home of Lady Gregory, also unfortunately uh, destroyed, in this case, uh, bizarrely um, by the state, um, I think in the 1940s. So uh, just to uh, give you just one little quote from W.B. Yeats and bringing Singh, W.B. Yeats and Lady Gregory together. Uh, this comes from the Municipal Gallery Revisited, a poem written by W.B. Yeats at quite late in his life where he's walking through Hugh Lane's gallery and reminiscing, quite a beautiful poem. Um, and he says at one point, Mancini's portrait of Augustus, Augusta Gregory, greatest since Rembrandt, according to John Singh, a great ebul ebullient portrait certainly, but where is the brush that could show anything of all that pride, that humility? And I am in despair that time may bring approved patterns of women or of men but not that self-same excellence again. So a lovely um, tribute to his uh, friend and in fact, colleague in many respects, uh, Augusta Gregory. So uh, Hugh Lane also commissioned uh, Jacob Epstein, the sculptor, to uh, sculpt um, Lady Gregory's uh, head, uh, which neither of the people, however, said that when they saw it, the tilt of her head was something very reminiscent of uh, her in person. So it, it's an interesting thing to look at how people react to a portrait of someone they know. Um, and it can be kind of insightful to look at who likes it and who doesn't and might there be reasons uh, if it's say for example not flattering enough or something along those lines and um, so this in this instance uh, here is a little problematic and um, even the um uh, the artist uh, talked about um how difficult it was for him because he wasn't all that enamored with Lady Gregory and um, saying that uh, the encounters uh, between them um, was di were difficult and awkward um, and that she was a vain English woman concerned only with her appearance, which is quite interesting because a lot of the time we really uh, understand Lady Gregory to be um, described as sort of plain or um, 
you know, the sort of criticisms of how uh, she looked and that she was this intellectual rather than um, the sort of butterfly like her sister Adelaide. So it's kind of an interesting thing to uh, look at. And it also reminds us that these things can be very subjective anyway and um, a different understanding and standards uh, based on who's talking to who at any given time. And of course, the vanity here might not necessarily be um, you know, something that is unusual for the time. You know, this idea of women having to present themselves in certain ways. So in terms of that idea of beauty and vanity and presenting yourself in a certain way, uh, Lady Gregory describes her sister this way. She says, uh, she, Adelaide, was queenly as poets and painters of the Renaissance have taught us to imagine queens. The head well carried, the oval face well moulded, the stature sufficient, the dark beautiful eyes were at tragic moments indignant, but their expression changed to happy content when she, content when she was with children or occupied with the handiwork or embroidery she loved. With all her kindness, she was a somewhat stern judge of herself and those dear to her. She was shy and unresponsive from a lack of self-confidence in the society where she was so much admired and she never really loved it. So this is Lady Gregory talking about her sister and how she was sort of forced to be the one that went to the parties and went to the ball, sort of Cinderella of the family. Um, and yet it wasn't really what she was interested in and she didn't particularly enjoy being presented in this way. And arguably uh, the more social one, Lady Gregory probably would have been better suited to it. But this again is this idea of judging which of the daughters is most likely to marry well. And that seems to be based on appearance um, in the time that we're looking at. So um, what we have then is uh, a wonderful account of one sister talking about another. However, this is written after the death of Adelaide and it's Lady Gregory re reminiscing and sort of thinking back on how she would describe her sister. Uh, certainly that idea of her kindness mixed with a sort of sternness is quite interesting because the little bits and pieces that we can pick up from letters or other accounts and um, that give us some information on Adelaide and her life uh, seems to suggest that she was quite stubborn um, and that she um, had ideas about living, a, you know, sort of good life that weren't necessarily um, practical for her to really enact because she found it difficult. Um, and this is particularly true, as we'll see in her uh, marriage. Um, but one of the fascinating things about her is that um, in her will, she doesn't leave anything to Hugh, even though uh, it seemed very clear that he was her uh, favorite child or certainly the child closest to her and um, as they were growing as the children were growing up uh, and it has been guessed at that maybe this is because he was so generous and tended to give so much away and um, and this may be why she decided to ultimately leave him out of her will but it is a fascinating uh, thing to consider so as I mentioned with Adelaide, she's this society sort of princess and um, not, not actually a princess, but society uh, butterfly. And she is not particularly enjoying it. She doesn't really seem to fit in quite all that well. And she becomes quite uh, evangelical. So she starts becoming very interested in religion and Christianity and living this good life and these ideas of living this good life. Um, and it seems that this may be why when she met uh, Reverend James, at the time, just James William Lane, uh, who was about, um, he was around about 20 and she was about 26. So she was a little bit older than him when they met. And um, she was uh, absolutely madly in love with him and um, he was educated as you can see here in Winchester College in Hampshire after which he enrolled um, as a divinity student in Trinity and um, he then left Trinity went to Emmanuel College Cambridge and had uh, received a Bachelor's of Arts degree eventually becoming um, ordained and uh, a reverend in the Church of England. So he was um, born in Cork and born to a merchant class family but a merchant class family who had um, a series of members of their family throughout the 19th century and in fact even in the 18th century who were very high up officials in Cork. So from being Lord Mayor to High Sheriff, all of these different positions. So uh, although 
sort of status wise maybe um within the social um uh, rules they were lower than uh the purse family um they still were significantly uh, high up uh, in society but the way that her family responds you really wouldn't think so so um this is how lady gregory describes it she says it was a shock when on her return adelaide's return from that last brilliant season it was discovered rather than confessed that she intended to marry a divinity student of trinity college six years her junior without money or certain prospects beyond those in the church I remember the day well. It was as if there'd been a death in the house. We knew nothing of his family, uh, quite a good old professional one. Uh, who is he? He may be the son of an attorney, we whispered in horror. Uh, so he was. But our ideas of attorneys have widened since then. I think we've taken them from Miss Edgewood's uh, novels, Mariah Edgewood's novels. Um, so this is uh, the response within the family that this great hope of the beautiful daughter really comes to nothing or uh, in their minds comes to nothing. Uh, another uh, extraordinary addition to this comes from um, the old nurse, uh, possibly Mary Sheridan, who was an Irish speaker and um, very lightly inspired uh, young lady Gregory. Um, and she said, our old nurse, half a century in the family had yet a worse possibility in mind and was heard muttering I don't like those sorts of names lane and street and field they are apt to be given to foundlings so even the um, nanny or nurse in the household didn't like this idea of this marriage so what ends up happening is that the family um, decide to not give permission for these uh, young people to marry um, certainly not immediately they eventually sort of give, give in but they want it to be a long engagement and they want him to have graduated before they marry and um, and this means as has been often stated in relation to these two that by the time they marry they'd hardly seen each other and they really were kind of strangers to each other and lady gregory very clearly indicates that they were not well matched that they were quite different in terms of personality and um, and not only that but this romantic idea of marrying this man and um, for adelaide turns a little sour when she realizes that luxury life luxurious life that she's used to um in roxborough and um, is not going to be replicated in her married life so um, as is interestingly phrased, uh, if you read certain uh, biographies, that although an unhappy marriage, it was relatively successful in terms of children in that they had um, uh, uh, a series of children, six children that were uh, surviving and um, some, the first child actually died, but the other uh, six were um, survived to adulthood, which wasn't always the case then. So they were married somewhere around 1870. Um, and um, this is a, a sort of guesstimate because we're not exactly sure as to when they're married, but we do know that they were separated in 1893, which was extraordinarily unusual at the time and relatively frowned upon. And although Lady Gregory was the one to essentially stand in for her sister in the legal uh, battles that ensued. Um, Lady Gregory also sort of suggests that um, this was not the right thing for a woman to do, that really she should have stayed with her husband and that the reason she didn't was due to jealousy. And this jealousy um, may be that um, James Lane had a mistress, we're not 100% sure, but there is an indication that the reason Adelaide was able to uh, retrieve her um, dowry um, after the separation was that she then um, gave over certain letters that had been um, uh, from, um, as they describe it, Jim's woman. So whether this means this was an affair or what was going on, it's, it's quite hard to know. But there's enough hints there for you sort of to read between the lines. As you can see here, their um, first son, um, Alfred, was born in England. Uh, he died in South Africa, um, mauled by a lion, quite an extraordinary death. Uh, his body was never found, but eventually, you know, they sort of declared him dead in 1911. Uh, Harold uh, also went to South Africa for a while, but came back to uh, England. Um, and he um, uh, married and had uh, two daughters. So uh, Hugh Percy Lane, full name, as we mentioned, already born in Douglas, the only one born uh, in Ireland, incidentally. 
and his body was never found either um, when he died uh, on the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915. Um, and then there was the Reverend Ambrose Bassett, who emigrates to Canada, the only one to follow in his father's footsteps um, and become a clergyman. Uh, and then Augusta Ruth, but known as Ruth, um, who outlived them all. And we'll look at a portrait of her in a moment. And then uh, Eustace O'Grady, who actually, as far as we can tell, lived with his mother until her death in 1909. Certainly he was the one who sends the telegram to Lane um, explaining that their mother had just died uh, at one o'clock uh, and, and went quietly. Um, so it seems that he had actually stayed living with his uh, mother and then he married quite soon after his mother's death and then he died in 1913. So um, quite a lot of uh, unfortunate situations in the family. So just to show you a, a wonderful um, image of... Um, Hugh as a child, uh, swinging on a swing, uh, dressed up in this beautiful uh, uh, frilly uh, lace collars and cuffs. And the stories that are told by Lady Gregory of him as a child, again, where we get most of our insight, is that he was very um, weak and very ill as a child. And he was the only one to not be sent away to school. He was also the one to be um, always given the best of things, particularly in relation to food, to try and tempt him to eat. But Lady Gregory talks about how he did not have a very good uh, appetite and that he was very sort of frail and... Um, thin his whole life and um, she also talks quite extensively about how much he enjoyed um, beautiful objects even from a young child and that he would love to um, you know go to her house uh, uh, cool and to look through her collection of beautiful things and that from a very young age he seems to have had this interest in um, the arts and certainly wasn't interested in sport or um, uh, rough games or rough playing as uh, Lady Gregory phrases it. Um, his sister Ruth um, suggests that because when uh, their mother was pregnant with Hugh she was in Ballybrack House in Cork which had been left to her husband from his aunt Eliza and they um, were packing up all the objects and all the paintings and this is why and as I say she was while she was pregnant and Ruth has suggested that that might be then um, the reasoning uh, behind uh, Lane's later interest in art which is an interesting theory but not unusual people did think strange things about um, what uh, whatever uh, pregnant women were exposed to would have a, an influence on the child and um, so when he uh, is old enough and looking for work, he didn't go to school, he didn't go to college because, again, he was sort of kept at home. Uh, Lane enters the firm of P&D Colnagli, Col Colnaghi, um, which was an art dealership in St. James's. He got the job actually through Lady Gregory um, and he... Uh, was really quite good at this job although he didn't seem to get on all that well with his employers and it seems by the time he was 23 he had opened his own gallery on Pall Mall and um, his friend William Morpin would later say that it was like Hugh Lane had x-ray vision that he was able to see under years of grime and dirt and overpainting, he was able to recognize um, a work by an old master or something that was actually much more valuable than it appeared to be. And quite um, quickly, he makes a fortune um, working as an art dealer in London because he's so good at spotting these uh, works. And his mother, um, uh, writing to Lady Gregory, was thrilled with uh, his success and his choice of career. And um, it seems that uh, although he was initially just working for quite a small wage and um, she had already been predicting that he would make thousands which he ultimately uh, did you know sort of like 10,000 in a year which was a lot of money then so um Lady Gregory at around this period uh, or just before when she is um talking in uh, sort of mentioning Hugh in her diary she records that actually she was very irritated by him as a young man um, and that she saw him as a second rate uh, that you know she was irritated by what she saw as Hugh's second rate fashionable talk and vulgarity of mind and this was um, echoed by WB Yeats who 
um, remembered with thinking back on the first time that he met Hugh Lane, that he was this kind of annoying um, young man full of all these, you know, fashionable ideas. And he kept talking about all the big houses he'd been to and they were all a little irritated by him. Of course, both Lady Gregory and WBH become very good friends and uh, very close to Hugh Lane later, but this was their initial um, understanding of him. Uh, and it, it's always made me sort of think about, um, in particular, the um, 1980s version of Jeeves and Worcester with Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie, um, and in particular, his Aunt Augusta, um, and the way that she sort of is this imposing character and telling him what to do, and he's this sort of flighty, fashionable young man, uh, which in my mind uh, is how I like to imagine Lady Gregory and Hugh Lane at this time. So at one point she mentions, you know, meeting him for lunch and that that was her good work done. In other words, he was so difficult to be around that she felt she was doing something charitable by looking after, by going to see him uh, or looking after him by feeding him essentially. Um, this is Rose Barton's uh, um, painting. So we looked at Rose Barton a moment ago, painting the um, entrance into the ball at Dublin Castle. And this is her painting of Lindsay House, which was um, the main home uh, of Hugh Lane after he sort of made his money and was able to buy somewhere. He never lived in Ireland, um, extraordinarily never lived in Ireland. Uh, he hosted a lot of Irish people in this house though, and his aunt would stay with him when she went there and other people. And then when he came back to Dublin, when he needed to be there, he would stay in a club on Stephen's Green. So this was sort of common practice for a wealthy gentleman at the time. Um, so one of the reasons why it's surprising he didn't live in Dublin was that he became the director of the National Gallery of Ireland in 1914. He had an office there and he found out that there was meant to be a court uniform for the director. Now, no director of the National Gallery prior to Hugh Lane had bothered to figure out what this was. There wasn't one in existence uh, or even an idea of what it should look like, but Hugh Lane commissioned it anyway and was very thrilled with this idea. Um, and there's an, a few Few accounts again of uh, Hugh Lane from Lady Gregory, where she says even as a child he loved playing with materials and dressing up dolls. And again, this was part of um, his sort of aesthetic and love of beautiful things from a young age. There's other stories of him, you know, buying veils for female friends or advising them on what to wear. Um, WB8 complains again about Hugh Lane always having to have a flower in his um, buttonhole and how he always wanted to dress for dinner, even when they were down in, you know, Cool Park and it seemed unnecessary. So this gives us a lovely insight into an aspect of Lane's personality and perhaps because he was spending so much time at home with his mother wasn't sent away to school and she had been brought up that way you know sort of interested in you know all the um, fashions and things because again she was sent through the um, uh, castle season uh, this may be the influence but we can't be uh, 100% sure, of course. Uh, so while he was the director of the National Gallery, he brought, bought and donated extraordinary paintings, including this work by El Greco. And it has been suggested that he may have purchased this because uh, the face of St. Francis is quite similar to Hugh Lane himself. Uh, but again, not something we can know for sure. What we do know is that he didn't um, accept any um, wage. He didn't want to be paid for his position. Instead, he wanted that money to go to buy more work for the collection and again this sign of his great uh, generosity. Um, so as I briefly mentioned earlier he was on the Lusitania coming back from New York after having gone over to help um, uh, sort of value paintings essentially damaged paintings and um, on the way back this was hit by a, a, a torpedo from a German U-boat because of course this is during First World War and it sank off the coast of Cork and it has been noted many times before that uh, he was Hulane was both born in Cork and then dies off the coast of Cork. Lady Gregory says almost in um, you know uh, viewing distance of the area in Douglas in Cork where he was born um, and a, a very sad and uh, tragic um, loss and as I mentioned his body was never found um, and this was sent out by his family um, to try and uh, identify him just in case so we get a little um, uh, you know, description of what he looked like at the time um, and even mentions the clothes he was wearing, the tie he was wearing um, and gives uh, this description of him. So 
Um, uh, again, no body, but there are memorial plaques to him in a few places, but this one was um, uh, put into place in uh, St. Luke's Church in Douglas uh, by his sister, Ruth Shine. And Ruth had moved in with Eulaine after the death of her first husband. So they were extraordinarily close and, and got on very well. And um, a lot of the letters and things that we still have today, a lot of them in the National Library of Ireland, in a collection there uh, were given by her so recorded and kept uh, by her uh, and some great insights so here she is again uh, Antonio Mancini the Italian painting her here this was commissioned by Hugh Lane and in fact it was painted um, in the rooms of Clonmel House which was the temporary location of Hugh Lane's uh, modern art gallery and it was painted in one of the rooms uh, upstairs in the gallery for the best light and although it was a very cold and drafty room um, Ruth was very patient and we know this from the account at the time and a young Thomas Bodkin uh, was there as sort of Hugh Lane's friend and assistant and when Lane brought in these laurel um, branches um, to try and create this sort of idea of them being outside even though this was painted inside uh, he then got Bodkin to tie oranges with strings onto um, the uh, laurel branches to make it look like an orange tree and make it all look more exotic uh, so although it's painted in Dublin it uh, doesn't look like it at all and uh, Mancini ultimately hated Dublin hated the food hated the climate and was really unhappy here but uh, he did manage at least to get uh, a few uh, paintings um, uh, commissioned by Lane and I think there's something like 12 in total in the Hugh Lane. Um, so this was the building um, on Harcourt Street and the first um, uh, catalogue of the works, about 300 works, and the catalogue was um, written by Sarah Cecilia Harrison, uh, a wonderful artist um, and portrait painter. And uh, this as a, a gallery was um, not just a sort of new and exciting idea, but even the way that it functioned and the hours that it opened. So it opened Monday to Saturday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then I think you know, until 6 p.m. on a Sunday, maybe 2 to 6 on a Sunday, something along those lines. But during the week, because it was open so late, it meant that it was kind of a social place and a lot of people visited it. And it was very popular um, with the general public in Dublin, not just the sort of upper classes. Um, and they liked to go and see these new and different and modern paintings. Um, in some cases, to comment on how terrible they were, but uh, ultimately it helped do what Lane wanted, which was to sort of inspire another generation of artists, art lovers, art buyers, art patrons, and as well give something to Dublin. What he said about this desire to give something to Ireland was he said uh, it was due to him being Lady Gregory's nephew and as such he had to do something for Ireland and uh, this was the idea. So if we look to um, some paintings by William Orpen, uh, we can see a little sort of insight into this world. Uh, here we have uh, Hugh Lane here, over here, uh, George Moore here, the writer of uh, Drama and Muslin. And in the background, we have this painting by Manet, hence the name of uh, this painting by Orpen, the homage to Manet. And this is the painting in question, which Manet purchased from uh, Paul durand -Ruel. He had borrowed it initially for an exhibition uh, again to sort of show these new ideas these new things coming from uh, the continent and France in particular uh, the development of realism and impressionism and um, all of these new ideas so this painting was considered to be the sort of one of the most important within um, the collection and um, a, a great representation of what was to be um, uh, this modern art gallery so um, uh, uh, the connection here uh, with Orpen is quite significant, but also with Moore. So just to very quickly show you that um, uh, Manet actually knew Moore personally, and uh, George Moore had written um, various critiques of Impressionism and uh, late 19th century, mid to late 19th century um, artworks. And uh, Edward Manet uh, painted him on more than one occasion. However, when this was exhibited, it was uh, cr uh, criticized um, for looking like uh, the drowned man that had been fished out of the water. 
And in response to this, Manny uh, seems to uh, suggest, uh, as we see here, and um, that Moore's request for changes to the portrait and the painter's refusal, noting Manny's comment that it was not his fault that Moore looked like a broken yellow of an egg and his face was all lopsided notes that Manny considered uh, the portrait complete after one sitting. So quite a, a, a pretty tough uh, review ultimately. Um, so if we compare this to say William Orpen and his sketch of Moore, you can see that Orpen is um, representing much more of a typical kind of academic uh, way of um, capturing a likeness and just also how extraordinary good Orpen was at capturing a likeness. And um, so just a little bit on Orpen, because of course he is the painter of the portrait of Lane's uh, father, um, James William. And uh, you can see here that he was born in Black Rock in 1878 and dies in London in 1931, relatively young. Um, and this is uh, a photograph of him by uh, Charles Burs Bursford from 1903. Um, and this is when he's just starting his career and actually around about the time that he gets to know Hugh Lane well. It seems that he's li most likely to have met Lane in London. Um, uh, and Lane then commissions this work um, from Orpen uh, in 1907. Um, and they were actually very good friends. They did fall out quite a bit <clears throat> over time, but ultimately uh, they were friends. We can see, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this study of Hugh Lane by William Orpen, a quick pencil sketch. And it's because um, it seems that they shared rooms quite a lot. Uh, I think the rooms were actually um, lanes but Orpen would sometimes stay with them. Uh, early in his career Orpen wasn't doing all that well financially and it was often Hugh Lane that helped him get work and employed him. Eventually Orpen will be one of the most successful portrait painters of the age um, but he needed a little bit of help to start with. Um, and uh, one of the things that's sort of interesting to note about Sir William Orpen is no matter how close he was to someone, he would still like to parry, to them, parry to them, as we can see in this cartoon here, which has Hugh Lane over here, and it has uh, John Millington Singh here, WB Yeats, and poor old Lady Gregory hardly given a face at all uh, in the background. But what I noted here was the ears, the exaggeration of the ears in this sort of cartoon way. And this goes uh, hand in hand with, um, uh, again, a conversation that we uh, know of, um, in this case coming from Viola, Viola Barrow's um, article on Hugh Lane from the 1970s, uh, where she said, instead of taking charcoal and paper, um, Sergeant, as he told Lady Gregory later, was so struck by the beauty and nobility of Hugh's face that he could not help putting it on canvas. But Hugh scoffed when Lady Gregory told him this and said, no, it's because he likes ears that stick out and mine do. And he likes ears that are red and mine are red. Uh, so this sort of self-deprecating side of Hugh Lane is interesting uh, to consider as well, given that I've already mentioned the sort of uh, almost peacocking um, way that he dressed and presented himself. Uh, incidentally, other artists like John Butler Yeats uh, complained that you know when he was trying to make a passionate point to Hugh Lane, Hugh Lane would be dusting the you know uh, hairs off his shoulders, off John Butler Yeats' shoulders, rather than really listening to him. Um, so we get wonderful insights into sort of character and how he was. So um, Orpen. Um, this is a painting of Orpen's parents. Uh, Orpen was related to Hugh Lane, but distantly. So Orpen's great -gra great great grandmother, uh, Sarah Purse. Uh, was the sister of William Purse, and William Purse was the great great grandfather of Hugh Lane. So they were distantly related. So they may have possibly known each other before they met in London, but they certainly only became good friends in London. And uh, just to show you that there's this lovely little uh, um, um, surprise portrait, self portrait of the artist in this painting. So it's up here in this. In a way, sort of hinting at the Arnolfini wedding, and um, so essentially referencing famous works. And Orpen was uh, fascinated by art history, but also contemporary art. And he claims to really have introduced Tulane to Impressionism and uh, some of the modern movements. Some people disagree as to how likely that is, but certainly they travelled together, and Orpen was uh, very um, instrumental in influencing. Lane um, on decisions around which paintings to buy. Weirdly, Hugh Lane was more conservative in his taste than Orpen was, yet Orpen sometimes has this reputation of being a kind of old-fashioned or 
conservative academic artist, uh, perhaps more as a teacher than as an individual. Um, but uh, it's something that's kind of interesting. Orpen's always, you know, full of all these contradictions. You think you know what he's like, and then you find out something that, you know, sort of proves the opposite to that. It, it makes him endlessly fascinating. Um, one of the things that was noted about Orpen, although he is this portrait painter receiving really important portraits throughout his career. The joke was, as you can see here from this little rhyme from Punch, uh, the 9th of December, 1925, Bill Orpen's rapier thrust is great. He'll paint your portrait while you wait. But though he doesn't want it known, he much prefers to paint his own. And you can look up just how many self-portraits are, there are of him. Uh, here we have one in the National Gallery in Dublin and another one from uh, the National Museum in Stockholm. And you can see the similarity in the pose, but he's showing himself in different guises um, and of course there's a great awareness of the uh, great Rembrandt and the idea of self-portraiture as a way of sort of recording uh, your life but also improving your skill because you're an easy uh, model to have there and always to have around and um, but of course the other thing um, is uh, as um, Orpen puts it that self-portraiture is the greatest um, act or the greatest practice of humility so this idea of really examining yourself and Orpen tended to exaggerate his own um, unattractiveness, as we can see here from the position of his jaw pushed back against his neck. Um, and he always saw himself as quite ugly, even though, um, as the photograph showed us a moment ago, and you'll see in a moment, he really wasn't. This was his sort of self-perception, which again is fascinating. Um, so he studied at the Dublin Metropolitan School starting at the age of 12, extraordinarily talented from a young age. And here's a wonderful sketch of him, uh, presumably in and around this time, this sort of self-portrait. He, however, hated his experience at the Dublin Metropolitan School and thrived much more when he moved to London and went to the Slade School. Um, he later, uh, you know, so he made these extraordinary life drawings, as we see here, in this hyper-realistic style. Um, and also still life uh, works as we see here. This is uh, after, however, his uh, career as a, or after his time as a student and into his career as a professional um, and teacher in particular. So here we have him uh, in this incredible uh, photograph um, from around 1907 when he is uh, a part-time teacher in the Dublin Metropolitan School. Um, and we can see some of his students like Sean Keating here, Harry Clark over here, and I think this must be Margaret Clark here, and Margaret Crilly as she was then. Um, and uh, he was an inspirational teacher, not only because um, he was so skilled and talented himself, but as, um, as some of his students said, he was the one that would bring over female models from uh, England uh, because Dublin was a bit sort of uh, fearful of anything like a female model in this period. Um, one of his uh, other female students mentions how he would allow them to sort of smoke in class and that they could socialize together. And he was very kind of fun and liberal. Um, and yet, because of uh, Keating being the sort of next in line who inherits a lot of the important positions in the art world in Dublin uh, and is very conservative, it has been, um, you know, blamed on Orpen to a certain extent. But as I already mentioned, Orpen was really um, interested in modern art and not actually that conservative. And um, again, it's these sort of contradictions, as I mentioned, with Orpen. So he serves in the British Army as an official war painter. Um, surprisingly, uh, uh, asks to be sent to the front line. He also asks to stay there longer than uh, was usual for um, a war painter. Um, so someone like, say, Sir John Lavery, who was also a war painter, Lavery from uh, Belfast, um, was very far back from the front line, whereas Orpen wanted to be right in the action. Uh, yet we can see in this self-portrait, this painting from the Imperial War Museum, where he donated uh, most of his paintings from this period, um, that he's sort of almost poking fun at himself with this uh, fur um, um, kind of waistcoat and the flowery um, 
uh, wallpaper behind him and the kind of alcohol in front of him. This is, again, himself reflected in a mirror. Um, so he's kind of poking fun at the situation or maybe highlighting the sense of ridiculous about it all. Yet when we look at, um, oh, he also wrote a, a text on it, um, uh, an onlooker in um, France from 1917 to 1919, in case you're interested in looking further there. Um, but uh, he also then, uh, in terms of the works that he created for his job, his role as official war artist, they are incredibly moving. And they're not the typical heroic scenes or, you know, propaganda scenes of all going well and everyone being a hero. Instead, they are much more poignant, much more um, personal and seem to really um, consider the 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 fate of these young men and the difficulty of what they went through. Um, it has been argued that Orpen never really got over this experience and it may have led to his uh, relatively uh, early death um, through essentially, you know, sort of hard living perhaps through, due to some sort of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. Um, so again, an incredible collection, uh, mostly in the Imperial uh, War Museum and really fascinating. You can see Rodin's Tinker as the inspiration here. So changing this idea of the, you know, kind of mindless drone soldier into um, reflecting a work of art, but also in particular, this idea of a philosophical figure and, and someone who is more than what might be just seen as a machine of war. So again, really interesting and um, some controversy around this particular work as well to the unknown british soldier and um, from 1923 modified later in 1927 because the original included these two ghost-like soldiers um, and although it was voted as the british favorite um, in relation to paintings from uh, the first world war the Imperial War Museum wouldn't accept it until he painted out those figures, which he ultimately did. And this is the version as it looks today, uh, modified in 1927. Um, Again, Orpin, just this fascinating, uh, fascinating figure. Uh, he would um, go on to be, as I say, one of the most successful um, portrait painters, uh, painting everyone throughout the British Army and uh, socialites and um, uh, you know, uh, figures from every kind of uh, aspect of uh, life at the time, including, you know, great figures like Lady Heath, who was um, this uh, Irish uh, pilot, and uh, in this case here, Edward, Prince of Wales, who went on to be um, Edward VIII as king, and uh, only uh, lasted uh, from the 20th of January 1936 until the 11th of December, uh, before he uh, abdicated. And this uh, brings us back around to Frank Brooks, um, who also was a, a great society uh, portrait painter and very successful, although really not as well known as William Orpen. Um, and Brooks was born in Salisbury uh, in England and he's considered to be part of this British school of painting. Um, what's best known about him is that he traveled to India in 1903, uh, where he was teaching uh, some of the royal family there as well as making portraits of them. And this influence in particular of his more sort of almost impressionistic style. And um, so he's closer to Manet maybe than Monet, say for example, uh, if we look even at this portrait here of uh, Adelaide, we can see the loose way that he's painting her face, yet there's a, a little bit more fine detail maybe to the flowers, uh, exceptionally beautiful uh, moment within this painting, these flowers in this uh, silver frame here. But if we look at the blurred look of her hand or uh, the way that um, her uh, um, scarf here that she has at the front uh, is all very, very loosely painted. So although this painting is not an impressionist painting, it's much more of an academic realist painting and um, certainly with influences of Manet and Manet in turn was influenced by Velasquez and these kind of layers of influence that we see here. Um, but ultimately this style was new to those in India and bringing over this element of a kind of impressionistic brushstroke um, was very uh, significant and influential, as I've mentioned. Um, he also painted royalty. So just as uh, uh, we had with Orpen, so we have with Frank Brooks. And here he is painting uh, the father. So uh, this is King Edward VII. And uh, this um, 
uh, you know, it gives a really good example of his ability to do these very um, official portraits. So you get this lovely sense of all the uh, detail of the um, uniform and this um, uh, cloak and all these, all the trappings of the king essentially uh, with this throne in the background and this sort of hint at uh, the um, opulence of the location, but kind of trying to show him as a man as well. He doesn't have a crown on, but we still know who he is. Um, and this is interesting because it's a sort of shift and change that we see happening in the 20th century with the royal family. So Brooks was very um, highly sought after in relation to these types of portraits. And perhaps the reason that he's not as well known now, and in fact, Orpen also went out of favor for that reason too, for a similar reason too, is that this is the period, this is 19, um, around about 1910. Uh, um, and this is the period where we see, you know, avant-garde movements from, you know, the Fauves uh, to Expressionists, um, and uh, Cubists and all these avant-garde movements. So when people are looking back on the history of art, those things are more exciting than this style of art. So it doesn't tend to be as uh, well remembered, which is extraordinary because these were actually much more successful artists at the time than some of the avant-garde artists. Um, some of his works are, look quite different though, and they're kind of almost humorous, which is something that he has a little bit in common with Orpin as well. Uh, this is uh, Mrs. Ridout, who was proprietress of the Coombe Express, which conveyed goods between the Coombe um, and the Shoulder of Mutton Inn at Salisbury. And this uh, was a, a real woman, because we have a note from Brooke saying that um, he would see her all the time and that she was so slow, that her pace was so slow, he was able to walk backwards with a sketchbook, making a sketch of her as she moved along um, and being able to record her perfectly um, because uh, of her slow pace. Um, so these are some of the types of portraits. There's other much more impressionistic, uh, loosely painted works from later. This is from 1878. His style gets much looser, much freer, and uh, arguably so does Orpen as well. So this is common enough for the more academic artists of this period to loosen up uh, over time. Um, and as I mentioned, we can see that when we look at uh, the portrait of uh, Adelaide Lane. Um, so there are two portraits together and we can see a lot of similarities between Orpen and Brooks in terms of the palette. This is a darker, what we'd sort of call tenebrous palette, so kind of lots of murky browns, which is very similar to old master painters like again Rembrandt. But we have this interest in this sort of, uh, you know, bright light and a loosening up of the brushwork and some of these influences of that kind of um, naturalism, that sort of optic form of art, paint as your I sees, not as you think you should see, so don't give you don't give every single detail uh, is something more closely associated with the influence of impressionism coming through. But neither of these works could really, as I say, be described as impressionist. So um, hopefully uh, you have enjoyed this uh, uh, coffee conversation and that you got to sip your coffee while looking at the paintings, whereas usually we don't get to have the coffee until afterwards. Um, and uh, just to point out again that if you want to um, keep entertained and keep up to date with what's going on on our upcoming talks from the Hugh Lane Gallery, you can visit uh, the hulane.ie. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you stay safe and uh, hopefully we'll see you um, back in the gallery before too long. So thank you very much and uh, goodbye. <laughs>